in uh, a town called Appleton, Wisconsin, and uh, while I was uh, in high school, I played in a high school band. I played the sousaphone. You know what a sousaphone is? I, That's the big bell, all right? And uh, then I was asked if I would join the 120th Field Artillery a band, uh, Wisconsin National Guard. So I went to the meetings there and played in the band, and then we went to Camp Sparta during the summertime for two weeks and went on army maneuvers, things like that. And so this got me started with sort of a uh, uh, military concept, and of course I knew the chaplain that was with the guard, and uh, the fact that uh, my father was a Lutheran minister, and I was heading for the Lutheran ministry. This all tied in pretty close to uh, my interest in, in serving the military as a chaplain. And then um, after after the Pearl Harbor, I'm jumping here to 1941, now, December 7th, I was in my senior year at the seminary in Chicago. and. Uh, I thought then that uh, the thing for me to do was to, as soon as I graduated and was ordained, that I would apply for the Army chaplaincy. But I had an uncle that uh, served in the Navy during World War I and as a Navy chaplain. And uh, he crossed the Atlantic 17 times on troop ships, how he got out with all the German subs on the I don't know. But uh, he encouraged me to try first for the Navy, which I did, and I was accepted. And I reported to Norfolk, Virginia in October of 1942 to the chaplain school. And uh, so this started my Navy life. And uh, right from the beginning, I loved it. And my first assignment was uh, at the Small Craft Training Center in Terminal Island, California, which is right off Long Beach. And my wife joined me out there, and we had a little boy by that time. So I had. Uh, about 11 months there before I got my first set of orders to a new aircraft carrier. And I'm a pilot, and so this uh, uh, this really uh, pleased me no end. And I boarded that in the story Oregon, and uh, I spent 18 months on that carrier. And it was one of the carriers that was caught at Lady Gulf by the Japanese fleet. There were six carriers and 13 destroyer units. and. Uh, the invasion was on, as you know, this is in, in uh, October of 1944. And uh, this was General Douglas MacArthur's return to the Philippines. But the thing they didn't anticipate was this Japanese speaking through the San Bernardino Straits. And they caught us. I'll never forget, we had gone, gone to General Quarters uh, on the morning of October 25th, 1944. and. Uh, as it is in the Navy, you go to general quarters an hour before sunrise and an hour before sunset. This is when the likelihood of Japanese submarine attacks would be, you know. And uh, so we got through the morning general quarters, secured, and uh, I went down to my room and stowed my metal helmet, my life preserver, and all the stuff that you wear in general quarters. Went down to the ward room, which is the dining room, and uh, I was just sitting down for sitting down for breakfast and. The chief engineer came in, Shorty Wetton, and he had full battle gear on. And the executive officer said, hey, Shorty, what's the matter with you? You know, you're getting uh, scared. He said, listen, Rudy, when I walked before the TBS, which is a monitor which is talked between ships on the horizon, 15 mile radius. And he said, when I hear Japanese voices, he said, and just send general quarter sound again. And here, I, my battle station was on the bridge, the open bridge. And the commanding officer of the ship said, Elmer, I want you to talk over the one MC to tell the guys below decks in the engine room, you know, the guys that can't see. I want you to describe what's going on topside here so that these men can see. And our combat air patrol had taken off and had landed again after its routine. And here were these fighters and torpedo bombers sitting on the deck without full gasoline tanks. And uh, you can see on the horizon these ships coming up, and then you see these little pinpoints of fire. The Japanese didn't have radar. And so they would fire these uh, shells, and they would land in the water be beside the ship, and one would be orange as the smoke would come up. The other would be green, and another would be green. Blue. They were doing this so that they could sight how close they were getting to the ship. Well. 
we, the battle went on for two hours and 35 minutes. They put, uh, they sank the carrier to the right of us on our starboard beam, about 3,000 yards. That was a Gambier Bay. Uh, they had, uh, the shells from the Japanese fleet had gone down in their engine, engine room. The ship went dead in the water. That drifted back into the oncoming Japs, and they sunk her at point blank range. And then they machine gunned the crew in the water. And the next one was the St. Lowe, which was 3,000 yards off of our starboard beam. And two kamikazes hit her. Her elevator, her after elevator was down to bring airplanes up to the flight deck, you know. And they went in to the after elevator and exploded between the, right, the racks of torpedoes. She sank in 20 minutes. And here I'm watching all this stuff, telling the guys below deck, you know, what's going on. They put 25 direct hits into our carrier. and. Uh, some of the crazy things that happened is that, uh, for instance, between the aviation gasoline tanks, there was an 18-inch void, and uh, we had shells go between that 18-inch void, didn't rupture the tank on either <laughs> side and explode outside. And the Japs thought that they were going to come into Admiral Halsey's 6th Fleet, and uh, they put armor-piercing ammunition, and uh, the reason why they didn't explode is that we didn't have any armor. <laughs> The shells would explode out on, in the air uh, beyond the ship. If they had used what they called HE explosive, the high explosive uh, shells, we would have been blown out of the water. But at any rate, we had uh, fire started down in our engine room by exploding shells in the ship, and uh, the ship was a total mess. And the communications watch officer came up and he said, Elmer, uh, before the command comes to abandon ship, I want you to take these the communication code books over the side of you to be sure that they were on the bottom of the Philippine Sea. Well, that's how, how serious it was. But uh, we uh, had two kamikazes hit us, but they came in and hit the flight deck and bounced over the side of the and they had their bombs were expected. They didn't have any explosive gear on them. So uh, we were saved from being blown out of the sea that way. We had uh, a Japanese submarine came up into our wake, and this is incredible because uh, they fired the torpedo at us, and the torpedo, this is what I should have said, that uh, the, the torpedo was following us in our wheat, and you can't get away from a torpedo in your way, no matter what you do. And so we had a gunner named Jenkins, and uh, he, we had one large cannon on the ship, it was a five-inch cannon, you know, on the fan tail, and he deflected the, the cannon down and fired it to the path of this coming torpedo, and all of a sudden, this <laughs> immense explosion and blew the thing out of the sea. Of course, there was a yell that went up all over the ship. Oh, we had so many crazy things happen like that. And then uh, we, we were burning, and we had a fire. Uh, what happened is that we had two 14-inch shells come down into the ship. And when they exploded, one exploded in our freshwater settling tank so that the liquid con took the concussion, else it would have blown the bottom of the ship. And the other uh, exploded in our fuel settling tank, and that caught fire. So we were had running with a fire in our hold for 10 hours, and uh, nighttime fell, and we were <clears throat> heading down toward the northern coast of New, New Guinea at a place called Wendy, W-O-E-N-D-I, uh, where there was a naval station. And then uh, about 12 o'clock midnight, general quarters out again, here we had Japanese night fighters coming out against us. <laughs> Thank goodness we had American fighters that came out, and uh, these were the P-38s, and uh, they caught the Japs. And of course, we had the radar again they did not have, and so our planes could actually spot them, and uh, they were able to shoot them down without fit. But the thing is, if there had been any sign of light aboard our ship, some guy lighting a cigarette or anything like that, or a uh, thing, it, they could have blown us out of the sea, but they, it was a pitch dark night, and, and uh, so we were very forced there. So that we arrived at uh, New Guinea the next day, and we came in and, and uh, docked down there, and then uh, the captain, Captain Williamson was his name, he uh, called me to his quarter and he said, Elmer, I want you to have a memorial service. And uh, we had 55 casualties. And if that, that is really something they need to uh, line up. And what they do is they have these sacks of tarpaulin, you know, and they'll put uh, 
something in it to weight them down. It can be any, any one of several different kinds of metal or something. And then they put them on mess tables. And at a certain time, as the nuclear is sounding, they tip the tables up and the body slide off into the sea. So uh, it, it's one of the uh, saddest uh, experiences of my life uh, to see these guys that you knew, you know, and, uh, and to bury them in the sea. But uh, when the Naval Inspection Board came aboard at uh, New Guinea, they said by all rights that our ship should have been sunk because of the shells that had hit us. And uh, they ordered us back to Pearl and uh, then back to Long Beach, California to the Naval Shipyard there. And uh, I uh, spent 18 months on that ship. I was detached in April of 1948. Of 19, wait a minute, 1945, excuse me, boy. And uh, let's get out of here. And then I went to uh, the Naval Air Station of Livermore. Now, how much do you want to? How much do you want me to go on to say? Well, uh, this is this is fine. Okay. Uh, I, I just have one question. Wait. So, what were your duties as a um, as a chaplain? All yeah. right. Uh, the first carrier I served on, as I said, was an escort carrier, but they made it operational by assigning a, a squadron of planes to us because uh, the nation was, uh, you know, after an attack on Pearl Harbor, but our fleet, Pacific fleet, had been totally, almost totally destroyed. So uh, we had an operational squadron, and uh, I, as a chaplain ship, was in charge of morale, welfare. I was in charge of the ship's library. I uh, conducted radio broadcasts on what we call the 1MC, which went into all the departments of the ship. Um, I had religious services on Sunday. And this, uh, because of the hangar deck, you couldn't use that, so we had to use it in the after messing compartment. And it was, it was very interesting. Gosh, I had a choir. I had, uh, I, I had a, just like a church. You know, that you had in the Sweden community. It had almost uh, all the features of a, of a church, except we were all male. And, uh, how, many, see. how many people uh, were on the ship? Okay, these were, these were, as I said, escort terriers. They were built by Kaiser, who was a well known name in those days. He built 55 of them in Astoria, Oregon, and uh, there were 840 men. And as I said, to have a chaplain, you have to have uh, in the, about a thousand men, and they have, they get one chaplain. If the ship has two thousand, they get two chaplains. So that would be a Protestant or a Catholic, Catholic or Protestant, whatever the case may be. They, you would never have a rabbi on the ship because there would there wouldn't be enough Jewish men to bring that forth, you know. So uh, the second carrier that I had was the Hornet, and uh, that was CB12. And this, I, I got I got the assignment to that ship with the same commanding officer that I had on the Cleanham Bay. <clears throat> we went to sea in August of 1945. Uh, uh, and then the war ended. Japan surrendered on August 14th of 1945. And then the Hornet was put into what they call the Magic Carpet, bringing the troops back from overseas. Man, you never saw anything like that. On the hangar deck, they had bunks that were four tiers high, you know. We would be carrying 4,000 men aboard that ship. And if you didn't think that wasn't something, on Sunday morning when I had a service, they have thousands of men attending my worship service. But the thing that was so interesting, too, is the fact that uh, a lot of people were being discharged. It was hard to keep chaplain assistance. And, Usually, you'd have a chapman assistant that would play the organ, you know, well, thank goodness I was uh, taught to play the organ and the piano as I was getting up through my early teens. So I'd, I'd get up and start the service, and I'd run over and play this little portable organ, get back up and <laughs> teach the sermon. And uh, so people said I had a real spiritual circus going on the ship. But uh, I think one of the most interesting things that I have had in this service when I went to the first carrier, it was in November of 1943, and uh, 
we were at sea at Christmas, and boy, if that isn't something, I had a wife and a little son back in Long Beach, California. Here I'm out here at, at sea uh, with a ship full of men, and it's Christmas Eve. And uh, the captain permitted me to, this is unbelievable, the, the captain permitted me to have a candlelight service on the hangar deck and fire, you know, aboard a carrier. You got gasoline fumes and all this. But they, they rigged it so that they had every precaution taken that, that there were no gasoline fumes in there. But uh, to see a group of men at sea at Christmas time, there were a lot of tears. And I must admit I was one of them. But uh, Captain Brown, I have a picture of he's the admiral that was downstairs, a full admiral. I, it was one of the, he was the greatest friendship of my life. And uh, I had his funeral with Annapolis in 1983. But at any rate, uh, as I said, the, the greatest experience of my home health career was at Lady Golf. And uh, you know, it's strange to, to be on a ship in a sea with an enemy force closing. And I was 25 years of age. And my only thought was, I wonder what my wife and my little boy was doing. You know, it just naturally you, you, you go back to those that are nearest to you. And uh, I didn't know. I didn't know whether we were going to be blown out of the sea or not. Unfortunately, and I say it's by the grace of God, here two carriers have sunk and, and uh, they, have, they lost almost half their personnel. And uh, we come through it, and as they said, I held one guy while he died. He uh, lived in a radio shack. And the way that the decks are arranged on a carrier, you've got the flight deck and the first deck underneath the flight deck is called the gallery deck. The radio shack is on a gallery deck, but one shell had hit through there and shrapnel had caught these guys. And this one guy had a, a gash through his back, and uh, the word came, Chapman, uh, we need you down the gallery deck. Well, everything's backing down. And so they had to open up these watertight doors so that I could get in there. And I held this guy, and, uh, and he died. Uh, arms like this, but uh, he was, uh, he was just one of, as I said, 52 that promoted the movie. So there was, yeah, I see the question in here, what, you know, what were some of the most effective, or, uh, how should I say, the experience that you've had that affected you the most, and I think that was the one to, uh, to see death at, at sea, and it's, it's, it's really amazing. Okay, Lee, what, what else can I say here to you? Um, do you, I mean, do you think he changed? Maybe oh, definitely boy. changed. <laughs> All right, I see it here. How old were you when you in the military? And I was 25 years of age. <laughs> I was a country boy, practically from Minnesota. I was born in St. Paul, Minnesota. And then went to Apollo, Wisconsin, where, as I told you, I joined the Wisconsin National Guard. But uh, to be raised in a minister's home uh, is one thing you can imagine because uh, you, you have a, a different atmosphere can't help it, being a religious family. Kid. But to get out there, I think one of the things that amazed me was the talk, some of the language that I ran into every day, and uh, it wasn't what I was used to. Uh, uh, sex. Um, what else can I say? Drinking? Because uh, when the guys got ashore, you know, boy, uh, alcohol was one of the big things that they went after. Uh, I also got a, a viewpoint into uh, the fact that a lot of people in my day used to think, well, uh, the Roman Catholics were the only ones who were going to be saved, you know, and, and over here the Episcopalians and the Southern Baptists and the Lutherans thought they were the only ones who were going to be saved. Boy, you learn pretty fast that none of that stuff makes any difference. <clears throat> and I think that that's one place where I learned, too, that uh, the narrowness as far as Almighty God and Christ are concerned, <clears throat> just, they don't play a part in your relationship as a gentleman. You just don't have that. <coughs> Do you think being from a small town helped at all? I mean, any advantage at all? So, I, I, think, I think one of the things was that uh, my vision, so to speak, was very restricted. I had a terrible concept. 
and that's one thing that chaplaincy changed very fast. It, 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 uh, you know, this business too of, of being aboard a ship and uh, being a sea <coughs> uh, is incredible. I'll never forget, uh, my wife and I were married on June 1st of 1940, and uh, on June 1st of 1944, uh, our ship was headed toward uh, the Western Pacific. We supported the campaign to Tarawa in the Gilbert Islands and in the Marianas and so on like that. <clears throat> All the uh, amphibious operations were supported by our uh, carriers, of course, and we were one of them. But as we came to the uh, uh, group of islands, there was a uh, note uh, that uh, the, had sensed that there was a submarine in the area. And at noon, <clears throat> on June 1st, the uh, port uh, sentry on the, he, he's in a little pit on the forward end of the flight deck. He said, uh, torpedo sighted at such and such thing. Here what had happened is there was a submarine waiting for us out here and he fired two spread of torpedoes. One was coming, the ship's out going this way. One spread of torpedoes was coming in this way and the other spread went this way, which would have come up along our starboard side. And uh, the officer of the deck his name was Lieutenant Clevenger. I'll never even forget the man as long as I live. Uh, according to naval regulations, when torpedoes are sighted, the command, and, and you've got to do it, this is what they tell you, you say, full speed ahead, full right rudder. He said, all engines stopped. So the Kalina Bay stopped, this spread of torpedoes, which would have caught us on our port bow, you know, went by this way, and taking a full right turn, these along our starboard side would have caught us. He saved the ship, and yet he was court-martialed because he didn't get the right command. Now, isn't that amazing? But these are some of the things, and the captain, Captain Brown, wrote me a note, and I, we got it, uh, and he said, uh, Elmer, congratulations on the years and Margaret's anniversary. He said, today Almighty God smiled at you. He said, because you, we were saved, because we most certainly would have been going out of the sea. So, I had, you know, I had some incredible experiences. And even as I think about it, I think, oh my gosh, <laughs> you, you feel the, the experience over again. How many, how many total years were you in? Well, what happened is that uh, I, Captain Brown again asked me if I'd join the regular Navy. We went, everybody went in as reservists. And uh, so I joined the regular Navy while I was aboard the Cleveland Bay. I stayed in the regular Navy 16 years. And then, in 1900, I think after that, in 1948, and I, uh, I was assigned to the new Ranger, which is a 72,000 ton carrier. And it was the same class as the Forrestal. Out of that same class became the first new carrier. carrier. We were not, though. We were the old oil type uh, carrier. And it was being built there in Newport News, and I was a senior chaplain at the Naval Operating Base at Norfolk when uh, I got these orders. And uh, the Ranger was supposed to be <coughs> uh, an Atlantic Coast ship, and Admiral Brown, who was then a full admiral, it was uh, Tom Six Fleet in the Mediterranean, Commander Six Fleet in the Mediterranean, and he wrote a letter to me, and he said, Elmer, uh, when the Ranger gets to the Med, he said, I want you to come over and have dinner with me. Well, at the commissioning ceremony of the ship, the then Secretary of the Navy, Honorable Gates, said this is the first ship of her class to go to the West Coast. <laughs> and there were 6,000 drones, and I was one of them. And there wasn't any indication given that they were going to do this. And uh, so, unbeknownst to me, I think that was the start of my decision that I was going to have to leave the Navy. But. Uh, the Ranger was of a solid hull construction and it was too big to go through the Panama Canal. So yes, President Eisenhower was then uh, in a, the, the commander in chief and he, he assigned the Ranger on what they call a people to people program. We went around South America. And we stopped in all the ports, you know, Trinidad, you name it, boy, we stopped. We went into Rio 
And uh, I was, in, in those days, they had a ruling that uh, you couldn't apply for transfer under 12 months in an assignment just because of money. I'd been in the range of a pre-commissioned detail, and I'd actually been in 17 months when I wrote a letter to the chief of chaplains asking if I could be assigned back to the Atlantic Fleet. And uh, when we got in to uh, Rio de Janeiro, I had a letter from him saying, Elmer, uh, you're going to have to make up your mind whether you want to be a Navy chaplain or a Christian educator. My wife and I had a private uh, Christian school in Virginia Beach. And uh, this school uh, was, had turned out to be a real, I mean, we had 500 students, we had over a million dollar budget, and I was handling that money flow. And uh, I wrote back and I said, no. I said, uh, I want to stay in the Navy, but that's not so. And I told him about the situation. And I said, you're forcing me to resign. <laughs> she said, next that I got back. The, the uh, chief of chaplains had uh, been installed as the uh, chief just two months before I got on the Ranger. And he was a Monsignor in the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, George Rosso and I were good friends. He had been in our home as a guest, you know. We had been in his apartment up in Arlington. But he had a very, very rigid nature. And they called him the Iron Duke. So uh, he said, when I told him he was forced me to resign, he said, I'm all right, I anticipated on bringing you back into the Chief of Chaplain's office. But he said, we're going to miss you right around the corner. So when I came into Treasure Island, California, I was mad as hell. And uh, I put in my letter of resignation. There was a commander there in charge of officers who were being uh, separated from the service. And he said, Chaplain, you're the only commander that has come through here that hasn't been under disciplinary action. He said, don't cut your nose off despite your face. He said, apply for a reserve commission. He said, you have it by law. So as I said, I was angry. And you know what you got? Sometimes you get mad. So I said, give me a couple days. So I came back the next day, I think, and I said, all right, I'd like to have a reserve commission. So I had 16 years in the regular Navy, and then I had 14 years in the reserve. I came back to Virginia Beach, and it was the best thing that ever happened to me. But uh, I, was, I was assigned the 5th Naval Di District Reserve Chaplain in charge of Little Creek and Libby Street. So that's where I uh, spent for the rest of my time. And, I retired in 1972. Yeah. Um, did you did you get to? Um, I, I know you all probably got off the ship some in um, while you were. Did you get to meet a lot of people? Uh, Actually, from the standpoint of liberty, and of course, we're talking first of all is wartime. Um, when you're in the Pacific. There's no place you go ashore. Yeah, I, I guess there's a, oh, a lot more in Europe. That's right. The only thing that, that you would do is, for instance, when we uh, were at Enoetok, was a, an atoll. You know what a coral atoll is? Do you have any idea, Lee? No. All right. You yeah. have these subterranean mountains, and then coral forms, or they're volcanoes, and then coral forms around the rim. And this coral gradually goes up until you have a landmass. And it's just like a great big harbor with one entrance to just something out here. And that's where our ships would go in. And of course, we weren't afraid of something because they had some kind of a radar watch that nothing could get into that passage. But say, for instance, now the ship went into Inuitok and uh, we were gathered there. My gosh, I have seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ships in, in these different anchorages and waiting for the next battle action, the next island we're going to take down. And my job as chaplain then would be to take portions of the crew, each man was assigned two bottles of beer, and we'd take them over to the atoll, and there we'd play ball, go swimming, whatever you want. And uh, I'll never forget one time, and it was in a wee talk, that I was out there with the guys, and of course we just had shorts on and nothing over our shoulders. And I got a sunburn that was like, oh my gosh. And I was up on the, tank, on the flight deck at night, the senior flight surgeon in the ship, Wally Allen, was my closest friend, and uh, we were talking with uh, Captain Brown. This is the same one that I called Admiral, and uh, I fainted dead away because it's, it's a summer. 
And so the captain, uh, there's always, he was one of the greatest practical jokers I've ever seen. But he, he put me on report for the fact that you're not supposed to be out in the sun and get sunburned. And of course, it was just a big joke. But uh, I, well, I was in sick bay for three days because of that crazy sunburn. It was awful. But these are things, you know, that uh, for the morale of the crew, you do everything you can. And the only uh, place that we'd have liberty would be back at Pearl. But you don't get back, you don't get back to Pearl. <laughs> Not uh, very often, you know, because you were way out in the far reach of the Pacific. But uh, I have some tremendous memories. It's fantastic.